Steve, first, thank you very much uh, for joining with us and be part of the webinar. And um, yes, we, we, it's something we're going to try to do regularly um, and try to do every two weeks uh, a webinar where we will give you inform, um, really nice topic to discuss about, but also um, help you to be educated to make more informed choices, really. That's the idea of the webinar. Uh, and each webinar will have an expert, and today we have Sue. And Sue is a, a fantastic functional uh, uh, registered nutritionist and functional doctor, um, which is also part of our A team, which basically means that she has been working on the platform with us uh, on the back end, uh, making magics into uh, all the recommendation and connecting the dots between different things. And uh, today we're going to go through uh, hormones. So it's an area of your expertise too, right? Um, and you, you have been a, a practitioner for many years. I'm not going to say how many, because uh, <laughs> you're still very young. Um, but yes, please tell us a bit more. Um, if I haven't covered too much about you, feel free to introduce yourself a bit more and also how you got into the whole um, hormone testing and, and, and all those different things. And uh, let's start with the webinar just after that. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for the invitation to join you. Thank you for the invitation to work with Omnos. It's been a real pleasure working with the team. It's, it's an incredible team and a very exciting project to be working on. And thank you to everybody who has joined us tonight. Um, I hope you find it helpful. We There are some questions. I can't see them, but I think Thomas can. So we'll try and cover as many questions if you've got any. So pop them in the chat box or, or whatever's there, yes. and we'll address them as we can. So as Thomas said, yes, I'm a, I'm a registered nutritional therapist. I'm a functional medicine practitioner. Um, and once I finished training my degree, um, I did a, a master's degree in personalized nutrition in the UK. I then worked in the lab. So I worked um, in labs in the UK on clinical education, helping practitioners understand their hormone profiles. So I've been working with these profiles for a long time. I also run my own clinic um, and work with a range of uh, clients helping to address hormone imbalances. And that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about tonight. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to launch right in and uh, start talking about hormones. If I can move my slides. There we go. So it's about hormones tonight, as, as Thomas has talked about. And so what are they and why are they so important? And really what they are is that they are our, our body's messengers. They're giving messages from our brain to our organs and back again. And it's a very coordinated, generally coordinated signaling system that goes on. Hormones tell us when to eat, they tell us when to sleep, and obviously even when to grow. They influence our energy levels, our mood and our behavior. They give us our appetite and our sex drive and help us obviously conceive and deliver babies. They make us happy, they make us crazy in love, and they make us sad. And while hormones are, male hormones are pretty stable, we all know that female hormones ebb and flow through the month. And sometimes for half the month, we want to fight our hormones. And for the rest of the month, we may feel much more at ease in our bodies. So our hormones help guide us through the transition of life from puberty to pregnancy to perimenopause and then onto menopause. And today we're going to talk about men perimenopause. So what is it? And here's the basics of it. So perimenopause is the time in a woman's life when the physiological changes occur that begin the transition to menopause. It can begin eight to 10 years before menopause, basically when the ovaries are gradually producing less estrogen. It usually starts in the woman's 40s, but it can start in their 30s as well, and maybe for some women in their early 50s. And it lasts up until menopause, and that's when the point when the ovaries stop releasing their eggs. Women are still having menstrual cycles during this period of perimenopause, and they can get pregnant. And so it's a period of kind of transition. It's a natural period of transition. I think in Western culture, we tend to think of it as a curse. And in other cultures, they think of it as a celebration of a celebration into a sense of being older and wiser, perhaps. 
So menopause, it's different to menopause in that menopause is officially diagnosed when you haven't had a period for a whole year. And then that's then qualifies as menopause. And perimenopause is that whole time between regular cycles and then moving on into that particular um, stage of life. My message tonight is that it's not a disease, but it's a window of opportunity. And so how can we embrace this window of opportunity? And with some dietary changes and lifestyle changes and understanding of what our body is going through and acknowledgement of the system, we're hoping that we can help make this transition much easier for you. So before we talk about the change, I just kind of wanted to go through what is a normal menstrual cycle like to put into context then what are the changes that we may experience um, during the perimenopausal uh, phase. So if we start with day one down in menstruation, day one of our cycle is the very first day of our bleed. So that's when our period starts and that's day one. And our whole menstrual cycle is controlled by really two glands in our brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And we're going to mention these a couple of times tonight. And it's the signaling between the hypothalamus and the pituitary and our ovaries that is controlling this menstrual cycle. And it's responsible for this kind of largely predictable chain of events and this ebb and flow of hormones in each cycle. And it's when we enter perimenopause that the cycle then becomes a little more erratic. So start a menstrual cycle day one, it's the first day of our bleed, and it's then up to this, from this day up to ovulation, which is day 14, that's referred to as the follicular phase. And in this phase, the hormone follicle stimulating hormone in yellow in this particular diagram does what it says on the tin, right? It stimulates follicle growth. And so that a follicle in the ovary starts to release an egg from the ovary to be released at ovulation. And in this first half of our cycle, estrogen reigns over this particular half of our cycle. And in the essence of that is to prepare for pregnancy. So estrogen then causes the lining of our uterus called the endometrio endometrium to plump up and increases the production of cervical fluid. And that's really essential for the survival and the movement of sperm preconception. But estrogen also affects our behavior. And so if you're feeling chattier, more sociable, more sassy, perhaps more attracted to people, more interested in sex, that's all part of it. And that's all in the part of the run up to ovulation and conception. And that's estrogen taking care of business. So then around day 14, luteinizing hormone takes the stage, and this is the second hormone. And when luteinizing hormone surges, that's when that causes the ovarian follicle to tear and release a mature egg. And that's the process of ovulation. And then for the remainder of the cycle, the remnants of that ovarian follicle called the corpus luteum then is required, to then that's where progesterone is synthesized from that corpus luteum. So the second part of our cycle is called the luteal phase, and that's where progesterone is much more in dominance, and you can see that in the blue line. So after ovulation, progesterone is produced in order to support the implantation and the, of, the, of the egg and pregnancy. It alters and maintains our endometrium, endometrium. So it's been plumped up by estrogen, and then progesterone is about priming that endometrium to take on that fertilized egg if conception has taken place. So progesterone kind of slows us down. It seeks to nourish and protect us and take care of us in the second half of the cycle in case we need to take care of that, that fertilized egg. So you may feel less outgoing. You may feel a little more introverted. You may feel like staying home um, and putting your feet up and turning on the TV than, being, than painting the town red. And it's about understanding that. And our digestive systems also kind of slow down so that our body can extract more food and nourish that developing embryo. But if this textbook cycle doesn't sound like yours, that's okay too. Because research has shown that as little as 12% have a regular 28-day cycle. And perimenopause is certainly a time when the cycle length varies. So don't feel like you're abnormal if you, your cycle doesn't fall into this. The many, many women, very few women really have this, this very perfect cycle. And we're hoping that we're going to be able to, to, to help you with that. 
So let's dive into a little bit about these particular hormones, because that's what we can help you with in the profile that we're going to work with and show you can help you with. So these are the major players. They're not our only hormones, but we don't have time to dive in all of the hormones tonight. So we're kind of going to focus on estrogen and progesterone and starting with estrogen. So it's the collective name for a number of hormones and we call them, we refer to them as E1, E2 and E3. Estrogen is produced in the ovaries, but also made in our adrenal glands and also in our fat tissues. Estrogen has over 300 different functions in the body. It's an incredibly important hormone. In essence, it makes us female. It helps us to feel confident, alluring, and sensual. It helps clear up our skin, helps us learn new skills, and feel on top of the world. It's very important around our hormonal tissues, supporting our vaginal tissue, maintaining bone density and muscle, maintaining memory and concentration. It plays a role in insulin sensitivity and the utilization of glucose. It has cardiovascular and heart protective effects, regulates our body temperature and increases the water content of our skin, helping it feel more supple. But we need progesterone to balance out those activities of estrogen and progesterone plays that role it's very much about balancing estrogen it's reproduced as we said as a result of ovulation and it dominates the second half of our cycle it prepares our lining and our uterus for a fertilized egg and it's really necessary to it's essential for maintaining that early pregnancy so the progesterone has the calming effect to that boisterous estrogen if you like it's a natural antidepressant. It also has cardiovascular effects. It improves bone density. It helps to decrease menorrhagia, so very painful periods, dysmenorrhea, cramping, and heavy periods. And it improves anxiety and mood swings as well. So after ovulation stops and after our last period, progesterone production will stop. And it's the lack of progesterone that may lead to irregular or even heavier periods than normal during this perimenopausal phase. Our estrogen levels fluctuate, they decline and become unpredictable, um, but our progesterone levels also drop. And so declining levels of progesterone can result in spotting or bleeding, or maybe breakthrough bleeding, irregular cycles, increased PMS, cyclical headaches, bloating or water retention, and swollen breasts or breast tenderness or pain. So as we age, progesterone declines and it plays this balancing role in estrogen. And so we get into the stage of progesterone dropping further than estrogen and the balance between them. And it's the balance between them that we need to play, that we need to focus on and pay attention to. So if we look at the stages of menopause, so here's our estrogen levels in pre-menopause during our reproductive years, and then our last regular period, any time really from 35 to 45, perhaps maybe where that happens. And that's where we start the stage of perimenopause. And our last period average is about 51 years old, but it can be either side of that. And we get into menopause and then obviously post-menopause. And we can see here how the estrogen levels drop as we work our way through this process. Um, where estrogen levels are probably at their highest in our mid 30s. And then they slowly decrease through the age, through menopause and beyond um, as, we, as we pass through those stages. But what I wanted to emphasize here is we can see these drops in estrogen, but how that progesterone drops more quickly and there's a higher Oh, sorry, a faster drop in progesterone than there is estrogen. And that can result in this kind of imbalance. And we refer to it possibly as estrogen dominance or unopposed estrogen. And that can contribute to some of those classic symptoms of perimenopause and menopause that we'll come to. So this graph is something similar. It shows us the estrogen dropping in the progesterone, but it also shows us testosterone, human growth hormone, and DHEA or dehydroepiandrosterone. And these are our male, so-called male hormones. Obviously we all have them. Um, we all, both men and women have both male and female hormones. 
Um, and we're not going to spend a lot of time, but I just wanted to mention testosterone because it plays such an important role. It's an important role in female sexual health as well. It contributes to a healthy libido and plays an important role in estrogen production and to obviously helps with maintain muscle and bone mass, which is incredibly important, particularly for women as we age and avoid the whole um, osteoporosis and osteopenia scenario. And then there's another hormone down here called melatonin. So melatonin is the Dracula of our hormones. Melatonin comes out at night and melatonin regulates our sleep cycle. And melatonin and cortisol have an inverse relationship. So cortisol is part of our stress response. It's part of our sex hormone pathways. And um, it's reported on the profile that we're going to show you. Melatonin is hugely important. It also decreases with age and is affected by high estrogen, cortisol, and inflammation. And modern life that harms melatonin. So electric lights and staying up light and blue screens from tablets and phones and laptops and televisions delays the production of melatonin and stimulates cortisol production, both of which interrupt our sleep cycle, keeping us awake. Our bodies are rhythmic and they do best when we respect these hormonal biorhythms and circadian rhythms. We do best when we eat and exercise and wake and sleep at regular times. It helps with the balance of our hormonal function. Being asleep by 10 p.m. is the best results and the best, the most optimal production of melatonin. And I'm having this battle. Most of my clients and myself, I put my hand up. They're getting to bed by 10 p.m. doesn't happen very often. Melatonin also has an effect on the menstrual cycle and our reproductive functions. And there's possibly a link between melatonin and ovulation, our cycle regularity and our progesterone production in the second half of the cycle. And melatonin is a very important antioxidant. <clears throat> it may also play a role in this kind of age-related disruption of our circadian rhythm of that sleep weight cycle. And those further drops in the temperature, which accompanies our onset of sleep, is strongly linked to our melatonin secretion. And this obviously drops when postmenopausal, um, this drop is lessened. So how does this all impact our overall health? Before we launch into that, I just wanted to touch on the idea of the symphony of our hormones and that they're all connected. And if we have a symphony of hormones, which we do, we need a conductor. And the conductor is really the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And they are talking to all of our hormones through these different, we call them axes, if you like. So we've talked a little bit about the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian, ovary, ovarian axis. But they also talk to the adrenal axis in terms of releasing our sex hormones. We wouldn't be anywhere without our thyroid. It's an incredibly important um, gland, our master gland of metabolism. And we talk about the HPT axis and the feedback of thyroid hormone through the hypothalamus and pituitary. And they also talk to our gut. And so when we're thinking about hormonal imbalances, we need to think kind of out the box that it's not just about progesterone and estrogen, but what else is going on in the body and which of these other axes may be imbalanced and what can we then do to support these body systems more effectively? Because these are some of the possible symptoms that we might be dealing with. And so as we start to understand our body, we start to then perhaps tolerate and understand these symptoms rather than feel frustrated or angry or fearful of these kinds of symptoms. So changes to period cycle, that's the length of the cycle between our periods as well to our menstrual flow. It might be lighter, it might be heavier, increased symptoms of PMS, sleep disturbances, fatigue, just not feeling like you've got as much energy as you had before, breast tenderness, headaches or migraines and brain fog, memory problems, gut issues such as bloating and diarrhea or constipation, um, vasomotor issues, so hot flushes and night sweats, muscle pain, mood changes, hormonal issues around vaginal dryness and perhaps a reduced or an increased sexual desire, and then bladder changes, so leaky bladder, urgency, some incontinence perhaps, some skin changes could be more some acne, some drier skin, oilier skin, itchy skin, hair loss or thinning, 
heart palpitations, weight gain, and change in cholesterol levels. Doesn't sound like a wonderful place to be, but there are things we can do about it. And there are some factors that we can take care of that make sure that we don't go into an early menopause. So smoking, interesting research shows us the onset of menopause occurs one to two years earlier in women who smoke. So stopping smoking can help with our hormones. Family history, um, the onset of perimenopause and menopause can very often follow the same timing of your pet, your mother or your grandmother and often sisters or aunts so there is often a genetic or familial pattern in terms of the onset of perimenopause and menopause cancer treatment can affect um, the progress of these hormonal transitions hysterectomy so hysterectomy removal of the o oh, sorry of the uterus may cause menopause and with unilateral oophorectomy, so an oophorectomy is a removal, removal of the ovary and fallopian tubes. Unilateral is just one, or a full oophorectomy um, is both ovaries and both um, fallopian tubes. So that can also result in an earlier perimenopause. There is an autoimmune condition, premature ovarian failure, which may have the same, um, the same uh, consequences. And then toxins, and we'll touch a little bit on, bit on this. Our environment is full of endocrine disrupting chemicals from plastic bottles to pesticides, to fertilizers, to cleaning products, to personal products, and then mycotoxins produced by mold as well. So we start to understand the number of different environmental influences that may all be contributing to the change in our hormonal passage. So what can we do about it? What are the solutions? And there's a number of different solutions that we can work on, and we're in control of them. We're going to start with lifestyle and address stress. Our stress hormones and our sex hormones are intimately connected. They're all on the same pathways. And so we can't address any kind of hormonal imbalance without discussing and supporting stress and stress management techniques. And it's really whatever works for you. So sleep or prayer or meditation or simply breathing. So breathing, deep abdominal breathing triggers our relaxation response. We can't be stressed and be breathing deeply. And we can change it in just a few seconds. We can change that state of panic and fight or flight into a much calmer state particular vitamins, B vitamins, C multivitamin play an important role. Taking care of our digestive health, um, it's an incredibly important part of hormonal health. And when it's out of balance, um, in terms of some, you may feel um, increased digestive symptoms leading up to your period. So as our hormones start to change, more bloating, perhaps diarrhea or constipation. Taking care of our digestive health through color of our food, through variety of our food, through fiber in our food, and obviously probiotics and fermented foods as well is really important. And then minimizing those kind of foods that are kind of toxic to the gut and, and um, harm the gut and harm the gut lining, alcohol, caffeine, and sugar. Exercise and daily movement, it's a hugely important um, movement is, the, is an antidepressant, it's a natural antidepressant, so keep moving as you can, and obviously lockdown and, and working from home hasn't been good for us, we, now we only move from our bedroom to our kitchen to our office, and we don't even get in a daily commute, so moving is important. Addressing inflammation, we can do it with food, we can do it through fish oils, we can do it through curcumin, there's a number of anti-inflammatory nutrients, boswellia, ginger, that are really important too, so these are all, um, these are all options. Metabolism and thyroid, we touched on thyroid, our master gland of metabolism. When that's out, our whole system is out. If we've got an under-functioning thyroid or hypofunction, it slows everything down. It's, it contributes to weight gain, contributes to constipation, cold hands, cold feet, brittle nails, etc. So making sure that we've got the nutrients to support our thyroid function in terms of iodine and selenium. And if you are on any thyroid meds, to make sure that they're the right dose and that you're, you're working with your doctor on regular blood tests to make sure that your thyroid markers are being taken care of. And then obesity and insulin resistance contributes to um, increased production of estrogen and it becomes a, a kind of metabolic syndrome which becomes more difficult to deal with. Optimizing estrogen metabolism, so helping excrete estrogen from the body and we'll show you this in our test results, and then hormone balance and there's a whole range of 
of complementary therapies, acupuncture has been hugely successful for hormone balancing, as well as the use of phytoestrogens and botanicals. So what are these foods? We talk a lot about cruciferous vegetables. So these are the vegetables with a crust underneath, cauliflower, kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, rocket. They are very helpful in estrogen detoxification, particularly when we're suffering with those kinds of estrogen dominant conditions, fibroids, endometriosis, and any of those. Um, very high estrogen conditions. Sulfur rich foods, eggs, garlic, onions, leeks, mushrooms, they are all supporting in sulfation, which is one of our liver detox pathways. Essential fats, hugely important for hormonal balance. Um, some of you might have heard of seed cycling. If you haven't, Google it, seed cycling. It's the use of different seeds at different parts of your cycle to just gently balance estrogen and progesterone. Uh, fermented foods for our gut health, as we mentioned, clean, lean proteins, anti-inflammatories, balancing blood sugar. So getting ourselves off that crazy blood sugar roller coaster when we're starting with very processed car breakfasts and um, of um, processed cereals or pastries or um, anything that's kind of high carb and not enough proteins and fats together with perhaps caffeine and coffees. So can we introduce protein at breakfast and some really good fats just to even out the release of blood sugars through the day so that we're not on this crazy highs and lows of sugar and in a much calmer place with more energy, increasing fiber and minimizing tea and coffee. And then there are particular hormone balancing nutrients and botanicals. And when we have test results, we can be so much more targeted in using these kinds of nutraceuticals. Glutathione and N-acetylcysteine. Glutathione is our master antioxidant. It's hugely important um, in our liver function and as an antioxidant for taking care of any cellular damage. Magnesium and B vitamins are very important in what we call methylation. It's a process of detoxification in our liver. Vitamin C, zinc, D, and E. Vitamin Ds and Es are the fat-soluble nutrients. Needing fats to absorb them, hugely important as well. And then we have a range of botanicals. So Vitex agnus castus, this helps to normalize the function of the pituitary gland, which controls and balances the hormone, our hormones in our body. Um, it works as an adaptogen. It's hugely helpful in a kind of perimenopause menopause stage because this is when our um, hormones are fluctuating so wild, wildly and can help to create a kind of stability. Um, it can also be helpful if you're getting mood swings or anxiety or tension. Black cohosh, this is a herb of choice for symptoms like hot flushes and, and, and night sweats. Um, again, anxiety or mood swings can be helpful. Um, black cohosh can be helpful. Dong Kwai, this is from traditional Chinese medicine um, and can also be helpful for hot flushes and night sweats, fatigue and disturbed sleep. And then sage too, both for the hot flushes and those kind of symptoms that may we, be, we may be experiencing. We talked about that window of opportunity. And I just wanted to mention here that perimenopause may be the stage of life where it can be just more than a change of physical symptoms. Some refer to it as the autumn phase of life where we're confronted perhaps with thoughts and feelings which may have been suppressed for years. Creative desires, sexual desires that suddenly emerge, new ideas, new yearnings, and perhaps a greater need for self-expression or a longing to walk away from a life that you've lived and, and maybe do something differently. So this may be about simplifying and streamlining your life, setting boundaries, and perhaps starting to live in a different way, improving sleep, addressing alcohol reducing toxins, eating better, supporting our hormones, moving more, spending more time outside, rubbing your feet in the grass, spending time in natural area, places of green, and building your support crew, your friends, your family, and those who are on your side. So where are you at? Where could you be at in this transition? And how do you know where you're at? And how can we help you with some more information? So <laughs> there's a little poll here. Do you think you suffer from hormonal imbalances? So please do 
um, fill that in um, and have you ever had an hormones test? So please let us know and, um, and, and we'll give you the results at the end. I think, Thomas, we're we going to give results at the yeah, end. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this at the end. Yes, it's just okay. to uh, people, so we want to know. Brilliant. Okay, so what the team, uh, all of us team at, at Omnos, how can we help you understand your hormones? And that's what, what we wanted to dive into tonight. So the profile that we're working with and our solutions that we work with, it's all about understanding the balance between estrogen and progesterone. It's providing a really comprehensive assessment of your cortisol production. So what does your circadian rhythm look like? Gives a picture of total DHA production. So remember that's our androgens together with testosterone. It details our estrogen pathway. So how is the body detoxifying that estrogen? Hugely important. Methylation is part of that. And looks at melatonin as well. So our aim is to provide you really with a personalized hormone roadmap as to where you're at and where you might want to move on to. So what is it that we do? First of all, just about the test. It's a really easy at-home test to complete. It does not require a blood draw, so you don't have to deal with any of that. It's a urinary sample, and you literally wee on some filter paper samples at particular times during the day. It's really easy to complete and then simply post it back to the lab. What's important is that we need to complete the, uh, the profile on days 19 to 21 of a 28 day cycle. Now we've already acknowledged that not very many women have a 28 day cycle. And so talk to us about how we might need to adjust that. So if you have a longer cycle, you might take it on days 22, 23, 24, one of those days. If you have a shorter day cycle, you could take it on say days um, 15, 16, 17. So you can adjust it accordingly and the test kit will come with full test kit instructions. So everything will be there. And so what, do we, what, do, what can you expect? It's giving us this extensive profile along with estrogen metabolites. And the idea is that we kind of want to highlight what is the root cause of hormonal imbalances instead of plastering on symptoms. Um, and it's a sort of functional medicine um, principle. What is the cause of the cause of the cause? And so we're hoping to help you and work with you to identify that. So this is what you can expect. This is the raw data that's provided by the test result. You can see here that we map out the hormones um, in these hormone pathways. Um, here's our progesterone metabolites. Here is our DHA and testosterone, our androgens. How do we break down those androgens? And then here are estrogens. So I mentioned E1, E2, and E3. And then there are two phases of what we call detoxification. This is the first phase, we call it phase one, where the metabolites um, are changed into something water soluble and become um, almost more dangerous. And so phase two becomes really important. We call that's where we methylate or conjugate to make them safer and excrete them from the body. And so we're giving you all of that hormonal information. Additionally, here's our stress response. So we're looking at the production of cortisol and here's our circadian rhythm. So cortisol decreases in the morning. It's our get up and go hormone and then slowly decreases through the day um, where melatonin takes over. And so we map that out for you so that you can get a sense of where your cortisol is at. For some people in a very upregulated stress state, it can be very high. And if you're in kind of a burnt out, more exhausted state, it can be very low. And there are different ways to address that um, depending on where you're at. The pathways, it may look complicated, but there are it's really helpful to help you understand how it's all connected. And there are nutrients that um, help upregulate and downregulate those pathways. So it gives you a toolkit as to what you can do with your results. But Omnos goes further than that. And it's the intelligence of the Omnos system that helps you understand your results and really cuts through the technical jargon, if you like. So Omnos has mapped out the systems that are covered in the hormone test and they present that as a results overview. And then you can click on that and there is further information that is provided in the results, results section. There are personalized recommendations that are covered 
um, things to do, things to avoid, foods to eat, foods to avoid, nutrition, is, um, nutrition information is provided. And then there are some supplement suggestions as well. So it's more than just a test result. It's kind of a whole toolkit as to what you can do with those results to help you understand where you're at. So just wanted to pull this together in a, in a case study um, to help you make it more real, if you like. So this is Emma. It's not her real name. Emma came to see us. She's a 46-year-old female. And she ran at, with Omna, she ran actually the microbiome profile because she had some digestive symptoms and she ran our hormone profile as well. And these were her main symptoms. So mood swings and lack of motivation, high levels of stress, fatigue. She was struggling to lose weight low moods and depression, her sleep was all over the place, and bloating and constipation. So these are all quite classic symptoms. And so we ran both of these profiles on her. We ran the microbiome profile and we ran the hormone profile. And these were our findings. So no surprise, right? Low progesterone and high estradiol. She had really low progesterone and she had really high estradiol. So when we remember back to that graph, the difference between that high estradiol and lack of progesterone to balance it out, resulting in this kind of unopposed estrogen or estrogen dominance, which was contributing to some of those symptoms. Not only that, but her detoxification through her liver of estrogen was poor. So she had very high phase one, so she was making those estrogens more dangerous and wasn't able to methylate them. She didn't have the nutrient cofactors. Her methylation activity was, was not good. So her detoxification wasn't helpful at all. She had really low melatonin, sleep was not good, and she had a high cortisol metabolism. And when she saw these results, she started to understand how it all fits together. She started to understand that she wasn't crazy. And she wasn't that that she started to understand the physiology of her body and then what could we do about it. So we worked on her stress and her sleep, we can put in all the nutrients in the world right, but if we're not managing our stress and taking care of our sleep to allow ourselves to recover, we're not going to get anywhere. So that was hugely important. Um, she plugged into some of the really nice apps that are out there. Um, we worked hard on her sleep hygiene. We uh, wanted her to go to bed earlier. We wanted her off blue screens for at least an hour and a half before that darkened room, cool room. And we wanted this as a regular routine so that we were signaling to her body that this is the time to, to um, sleep. Magnesium, hot bars with um, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate was something else we put in that she really liked. And it just kind of helped her calm down at the end of the day. A gentle workout plan. So we took out some of the hit, um, the high intensity cardio workouts, and we put in some yoga and some Pilates just to help calm that nervous system. We put in a supportive nutraceutical um, protocol to support her estrogen detoxification, B vitamins, magnesium, sulforaphanes to help those pathways um, and the liver support as well, both foods and nutrients. We took care of her microbiome. She had um, some uh, bugs. She had some uh, path potential pathogens, which we wanted to take care of, some antimicrobials. We supported her digestion and we supported her gut immunity and also improved hydration. We haven't touched on that, but that was important too. And now she's starting to feel better. She's aware of the stresses in her life. She's been focusing on her sleep routine. Her weight is starting to shift. Her digestion is better. And she's feeling more in control. She's understanding her body. And instead of fighting it, is starting to work with it. And so feels much more empowered. So that's our profile. The code is hormones 20. And I'm going to hand back over to Thomas, because I think he might have some special offers and good news. Yes, uh, well, we always have good news, uh, <laughs> working very hard. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, 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 there's an, um, so the first good news, in, uh, and this is why I asked the question, actually. And uh, this actually, um, if I look at the question, so do you think you suffer from hormonal imbalance? It's, it's actually 100% we have here, uh, which is, you know, uh, quite a big one. Um, and um, in terms of having had a normal test done, 33% uh, ab. Um, so I have a good news for the people who have done the test and uh, good news as well for the people who haven't done the test. So um, the people who have done the test, 
we basically um, will, it, it's a bit of a hard work for us to do that, so, but we won't do it forever. But the people who have done a Dutch test uh, will be able to send us uh, their file, their raw data, if you wish, um, and we will happily upload this on the platform for them, so they can actually make a lot more sense, and it can be translated into the way we we work things out within the Omnos platform. So really making thing, uh, things a bit more simple, uh, and giving all the recommendation attached to it, things to do to avoid uh, or people to see, like you, right? Um, if really it's clinical and, and needs support, uh, but hormonal, hormones it's quite nuanced and it's really. Um, the, the machinery we have done behind Omnos is brilliant, but hormones are very nuanced from a person to another, and we really need to understand the context behind. So I would always advise, uh, if there is very um, um, persistent symptoms, to always work with a practitioner. Um, and for that, for the people who haven't done a test yet, we, we have this Hormone 20 uh, discount now running, uh, which basically give you 20% on, on the test. Um, and again, other good news is uh, Sue being part of our A team um, um, is happy to deliver uh, an initial consultation. Um, and this initial consultation has been discounted to £45, uh, for, which is very good value for someone of your knowledge uh, and you know uh, your your professionalism and, and, and all this, so it, yeah, it's quite uh, uh, very good. Um, so yes, this is all different things. So I would like to ask if anybody have question um, to ask. So I have I've seen a few already, um, it, and feel free to to ask more question. So so I have one for you already, which is um, what. Is your foot? It's, it's quite a common question, really. But what is your foot on HRT? You probably see that coming. <laughs> yeah, really good question. So, um, uh, when Thomas introduced me, he used the word functional doctor just to clarify. I'm a nutritional therapist. I'm not a. I'm not a doctor. Um, I can't prescribe HRT. Um, so I often work alongside GPs. Um, and doctors who can prescribe to support both with nutrients and supplements um, in addition to HRT. I have, I'm not against HRT by any means. It can be very helpful, particularly in the first five years of um, a menopausal transition. My caveat is to make sure that you get your hormones tested. And I very often the GPs will test them in blood, but they don't always test the metabolites. So the Dutch profile, which is the profile that we work with at Omnos, also tells us how you are metabolizing those estrogens. Without getting too technical, there are some protective pathways and some less protective pathways that estrogen can be metabolized. And some of them can, when they are not taken care of, can contribute to hormonal cancers. So my frustration with using HRT, if we're putting in synthetic is exogenous hormones, but we're not certain of how the body is detoxifying or metabolizing them, then I think that can be problematic. So I don't have any problem with HRT. I think it plays an, an, an important role where, where necessary when, when women are struggling, but make sure that you running profiles like this and working with you know, somebody who can see, understands the bigger picture of hormone metabolism. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another, oh, I just appear now. Um, I, another question which we have here is actually what is the difference between um, something like our test, our the Dutch test, and the blood sample? Um, but we, we can see some hormone profiles. So actually, uh, j just on this one, we are going to offer soon, uh, we're working on this, aren't we, Sue? <laughs> on, on the blood panel for hormone. But yes, it, it will be good for you to, to explain the difference, really, between the, the, the Dutch test and, and the blood panel. Yeah, it's a great question. And when I was when I first joined the labs, my clinical supervisor had this wonderful metaphor 
um, to understand how to test hormones. Hormones are complex and the testing for hormones is complex as well because we can test them in blood, we can test them in saliva and we can test them in urine and they're all giving us slightly different information. So let me just run through this real quick and, and hopefully I'll answer your question. When we're testing hormones in blood, um, we're, our hormones are transported through our body uh, um, by proteins called carrier proteins. And the carrier protein that transport hormones is called sex hormone binding globulin. And it does what it says on the tin, right? So that carries our hormones through blood. So when we're measuring hormones in blood, we're measuring them bound to their carrier proteins. So that's a little bit like having money. If we had a lump of money, but we have it invested in an ISA or some other investment, we have it there as a reserve, but we can't access it. And so our hormones that are bound by those sex carrier proteins are not available to dock onto receptors and make a difference. When we're measuring hormones in saliva, we're measuring a much smaller fraction of the hormone, um, but the saliva is the, is the bioavailable fraction of that hormone. We often measure cortisol in saliva. There is a very common adrenal stress profile where you can measure cortisol in saliva. Um, and so we're measuring a different part of the hormone and it's giving us different information. So to go back to the money metaphor, that's a bit like drawing your cash out of that investment and now you've got cash to spend. And then we can measure hormones in urine. And when we're measuring hormones in urine, we're measuring metabolites. We're measuring how the body's processed and metabolized those particular hormones. So that's a little bit like spending your money and then now you've got a cash receipt. So you've got a record of what you spent. And that's a little bit like what we're measuring in the Dutch profile. We're measuring kind of what we spent. Now, what we like about the urine is that um, there is very, uh, research has shown that in terms of cortisol, there is very much an, uh, an alignment between urinary cortisol and salivary cortisol, for example. Um, and obviously urine is so much easier to collect. So that is one of the advantages over blood for sure. Okay, so I have another question here. So um, it's two questions in one, and it's how do we book a consultation with you? Um, so I can answer that. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the initial consultation actually can be uh, booked uh, just by emailing us um, at support at omnos.me via the platform as well, by the messaging system. Um, we are actually in the process of doing a lot of exciting changes. Uh, for those who already have results actually on the platform, they should go today because already there is changes in the results, uh, but a lot more to come. Uh, but you will also be able to book you um, uh, on a consultation. Uh, but for now, you just have to request uh, within the messaging system, so or, or email at support at omnos.me um, to go through the, the results. And the results are seems to be um, from October. So that's Maybe a bit old. Uh, what's your what's your view? Usually we say three months, but what's your view to you on on how long hormones um, are still valid? Let's say. Uh, test. Well, that's a good question. And yeah. I guess it's, really, it's a really good question. And I think it kind of depends on the regulatory of your hormones. If you've got a more regular cycle, we might be able, from October last year, was is that what they're saying? Yes. October 2020. Uh, yes, it seems so. So we're in nine months out. You know what? You know, um, we'll work with them. You know, any test results is a snapshot in time. Yeah. Uh, any, you know, whether it's blood or urine or saliva or anything, it's a snapshot in time. Um, but they're all informing our health timeline. So we can look back and say, you know, are you, are you um, experiencing the same symptoms as you did then when you had those test results? Did you make any changes and any kind of meds or supplements or lifestyle or whatever that may have impacted them? So we'll work with what we've got. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I don't have it was a lot of the same question. So um, I don't have any more question here. Um, anything you would like to add to yourself? No, just thank you again for your time. Thank you, Thomas and the whole Omnus team. They're doing an amazing job. The platform thank evolves you. every day. Um, you can't imagine. Literally <laughs> every day. Going behind the screen. So stick with us, stay with us. It gets better. It's a better product um, all the time. Um, and if you've got any questions or queries, please feel free to, to email us at support at omnus.me and, um, and we'll be in touch. 
So yes. thank you all. And um, thank you very much for attending. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. It is actually being recorded. Um, and we will obviously send uh, all this via our newsletter uh, once it's just edited. So uh, that's also for people who couldn't come and join or join in the middle. Um, yes, so it will be available soon. Well, thank you very much, Sue, and uh, we shall speak again very soon, I'm sure. Brilliant. Have a lovely evening and thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>